Let me say a few things before I start. So number one, I had a review session yesterday in the uh, video has been posted, right? So if you need help with the homework, then look at the video. And there are a couple of little things wrong with the homework, which is explained in the video and explained in the message that I post. But uh, the announcement I made yesterday, but it should be pretty obvious um, after you see the video. Um, what was I going to say? Okay, so we have a test next week. Um, so this Friday is not going to be any homework, but there will be homework due on Friday, the one that I went over yesterday. And then a quiz on Saturday. Um, it's due on Tuesday. Next week, we'll review in class on Tuesday and also um, at the review session on Wednesday. I've been asked to post the previous review session from the previous semester, so I'll try to do that um, tomorrow or Saturday when I post the quiz. Also, um, the equation sheet will be posted tonight, so the equation sheet will be up. And I guess that's it for that stuff. The homework solution will obviously be posted after it's due on Friday. And okay, so there's a bit of uh, also good news regarding the last test, test two. Um, there are some things that are graded a little bit weird, and there is kind of an error in the answer key, but not really. But anyhow, so I'm going to give everyone an extra uh, six points to make up for all the grading discrepancies. So I will try to um, update that maybe tomorrow, but if not, just add six points to your test two score. That's your new test two score. Of course, it will affect your overall average. But like I said, if I have time tomorrow, I'll try to post, uh, update your grades with the six points added to it, which helps a bit. Um, okay, so does anyone have any questions with that so far? I think that's all I wanted to say before I started the material. Um, so today what I want to do is I don't, I don't want to get too far in the test four material because we have test three uh, next Thursday. So I'm just going to do a few things um, new uh, for test four and then uh, we'll do some sort of, uh, I think, interesting things at the end of the class and then you can go. I don't know. I mean, pretty, probably pretty early. I mean, the other class went early. I let them go early. So they went early. Then you guys can probably go right now. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so anyhow. But let me go through a couple things. And then we'll take a break. And then when you come back from the break, we'll do the more interesting things. So the last thing I was talking about on Tuesday was um, inductance of a solenoid, self-inductance. But... <clears throat> There, there's two types of inductances, like I said on uh, Tuesday. There's mutual inductance and self-inductance, but we're not going to do mutual inductance. We're going to focus on self-inductance because self-inductance is the more sort of practical thing to talk about when, when you talk about inductance. So anyway, the point is, I'm just going to say inductance, but it means self-inductance because it's the only one we're really talking about, right? So the uh, self-inductance of this thing of a solenoid. So the question is, you know, how do you calculate self-inductance? Well, it comes from this equation here. It's n times the change in flux over the change, magnetic flux over the change in time going through the solenoid. So what we're going to do is use this equation and calculate what's known as the inductance of the solenoid. So it's pretty easy to understand this whole thing. There's a lot of math here, but it's actually easy to understand. So suppose there's no current in the uh, wire. So you have a wire you know, with current in it that forms a solenoid. So the question is, suppose there's no current in the wire. Well, then there's no field in the solenoid, and there's no flux at all. That's what you start with. You start with zero. Everything is zero. And then you turn on the current. So now there's going to be a current uh, in, the, in the wire, and the change in current goes from zero to I. So the change is I, because you start at zero. And there's going to be a magnetic field in here, uh, which you have to know for the test on Thursday next week, right? The magnetic field of a solenoid and direction of the magnetic field of a solenoid. But the point is, there's going to be a magnetic field uh, created in the solenoid when you turn the current on. And the magnetic flux is just going to be the magnetic field times the area, uh, cross-sectional area, right? That gives you the magnetic flux, right, through the middle of the solenoid, basically. So um, the final flux, uh, so first of all, the magnetic field, if you turn the current on, is going to be mu, mu n, sorry, mu zero ni. 
And then if you multiply with that by A, that gives you the flux when the current's on, which is mu zero NIA, right? That's the uh, final flux when the current's on. So initial flux is zero. Final flux is just uh, mu zero NIA. Uh, the change in current is I. The change in the flux is also this because you start at zero, right? Because there's no field initially. So you just put this in here in the numerator. You put uh, delta I is I in the denominator and you multiply by N, which is the number of turns that you see here. Like if you count how many turns are here, that's that N. And you put everything here and the I cancels out. So the, it doesn't depend on the current, right? It's a, a big, uh, important part of the inductances. They don't depend on currents. So when you simplify, it becomes this. It's big N times little n times mu zero times A with no current in it. Now, you can write it like that, and it's fine, but most people rewrite it slightly. So the way you rewrite it slightly is you multiply this thing by 1, because if you multiply by 1, that doesn't change anything, but you multiply 1 in a specific way. What you do is you multiply by the length of the solenoid uh, divided by the length of the solenoid, because that's, that's 1. Of course, the symbol for uh, inductance is L, and the symbol for length is L, so you get two L's that are the same, so I use a green L to represent... Uh, lengths instead of a blackout, which represents inductance. Anyhow, so that's what I did here. You put one of the L's with the big N, and you leave the other L by itself, and what you get is if you put one of the L's under one of the big N's, or not one of the big N's, the N, the big N, you get N per L, which is N, little n, and so anyhow, it reduces to that equation there, which is um, N squared mu zero A times L which is the length of the solenoid. So the point is, there's a couple points here. This gives you the self-inductance of a solenoid, which to you doesn't mean anything right now, but it will mean something when you put them in a circuit and it makes more sense what this thing you just figured out is, right? Now, but the important thing is if you look at the, this equation here, it basically only depends on area and the length of the solenoid and the number of times it's wrapped per unit length. But as far as... Um, the, you know, the, the main factors it depends on is basically A and L, which is basically the geometry again, right? So it's basically um, what it looks like, you know, what, how big the area is on one side, how long it is. So anyhow, it's very similar to a capacitor. I went over this when we talked about solenoids and magnetic field from a solenoid. It's very similar to a capacitor. The inductor is very, this thing's, you know, solenoid forms an inductor, and inductors are uh, very similar to uh, capacitors. And so what I mean in, in this context is if you have a capacitor, right, what did a capacitor depend on? The capacitance. It don't depend on the, the area of the distance between the sheets, right? It didn't depend on the charge or anything else or the voltage. It only depended on the area of the distance between the sheets, maybe the dielectric constant. Same thing here. The inductance only depends on the area, the length of it. It doesn't depend on the current. It doesn't depend on the voltage. It doesn't depend on anything else. It just depends on uh, geometry. So this is another way where the solenoids which form inductors are, once again, sort of the magnetic analogs of capacitors, right? So let's do an example calculating self-inductance. It's only a quick example. It's actually pretty easy to do, but, you know, you see an equation, and it's, it's helpful to, you know, do a calculation how you actually calculate this thing. But the calculation is pretty straightforward. So a solenoid is a length. of one meter, the turns per meter is 100 per meter, that means every meter is 100 turns, and a cross-sectional radius of 0 0.1 meters. Um, so the question is, what's the inductance of the solenoid? All right, I could put self, in, once again, it's technically the self-inductance, but that's the only inductance we're talking about here in this class, so it's, I'm just going to call it inductance from here on out. Okay, so, um, by the way, the cross-sectional radius, in case you're wondering what that is, it's uh, the radius of the circle here on the edge, right? That's the cross-sectional radius. Okay, go back to the um, notes here. So the equation for inductance of a solenoid 
is n squared mu zero a l. So l, this funny looking l, is going to be length when I write it, all right? So that's, because there's two L's, one for inductance and one for length. So you have to distinguish them somehow. So what is the area of a circle? Because these solenoids are typ typical, typically circular, right? If you look at them, sort of edge on. So what is the area of a circle? Because you need to figure out the area of a circle. Almost. What'd you say? You say four pi r squared? Yeah. Almost. Almost. You're getting closer. <laughs> no. Well, actually, yeah, that is closer. You're getting closer to the answer you're converging. It's pi r squared, right? Yeah, it was interesting. You went from 4 to 2 to 1.33. It's just 1, right, times pi r squared. OK, so uh, times L. OK, so then you just put in the numbers, right? So n is 100 per, me per meter. So you square that. Uh, times uh, mu zero, which is the same thing uh, it always is. It's 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. Uh, times pi times r squared, which is the area. And then times L, which is the length, which is 1 meter. Anyhow, you put all that in your calculator and you get some number, which is 3.94 times 10 to the minus 4. And that is measured in Henry's, right? That's the typical unit for inductance. If, you know, all the other units are standard units. The units you get for inductance is in Henry's, right? So that's our first calculation of inductance of a solenoid. Okay, so now we have to figure out why that's important and why we need to calculate these things or find inductances of solenoids. What does it tell you? Okay, so let's go through this. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what happens when you start using these things in circuits. So these things called, you know, they're really solenoids, but in the context of circuits, you call them inductors because solenoids have inductance, so you call them inductors. So what we're doing here is we're putting it into a circuit. This is a typical circuit, a DC circuit. I mean, so we talked about AC a little bit last class. This is not an AC circuit. It's a DC circuit. This is a normal battery. It's not a generator or anything. It's just a typical battery. It's connected to an inductor, so this is the symbol for an inductor. It's like an solenoid, and a resistor in series. So the question is, what happens when you have inductors in these, ser in these circuits? How do they behave? OK, so suppose there's a switch over here. What that switch means is when it's open, there's no current in the circuit, right? So right now, there's no current in the circuit because the switch is open, right? OK, so then you close the circuit. What happens? Suppose the inductor wasn't here, right? Forget about it. Suppose it's not there, right? The second you close the circuit, what happens? What does the battery do? It produces a current, right? It immediately produces a current which goes around from positive to negative, like we talked about a billion times. And we can find the current by taking the voltage of the battery and dividing it by the resistance using Ohm's law, right? However, when the inductor is there and you close the switch, it tries to form a current just like it would if there was no inductor there. However, before you close the circuit, there's no current in the circuit, right? So there's no flux through that inductor. Remember, this inductor is like a solenoid, right? So there's no current, there's no magnetic field, there's no flux through the solenoid, correct? You close the circuit, all of a sudden this huge current tries to go through the solenoid. So the current increases by a lot, which increases the flux by a lot, right? Because the field goes up. So because the flux is increasing, this is a little bit about what I talked about on Tuesday, it creates a current in the opposite direction, right? Because this is self-inductance, right? That's the whole point of it, right? If the flux is increasing, it creates a current going opposite of the current that's trying to go through it. And what it does is essentially cancel out the current at first, right? So instead of there being a big current at first, there's actually no current at first when you connect the uh, switch because the inductor cancels it out. But then over time, there's a less uh, change in current over time. Because when you first connect the switch, there's a big change in current, right? And then as you wait, it gets less and less. And that decreases the um, uh, magnetic flux. The change in magnetic flux over time decreases over time. So the current fighting against it goes down over time. And eventually, the current gets through uh, the solenoid. And if you wait a really long time, 
the current is eventually equal to the current without the solenoid, right? So basically what I'm trying to say is if the solenoid wasn't there, the current would go from zero to V over R instantaneously. With the inductor there, it takes a while to get to V over R. It limits how long it takes to get to V over R. That's what inductors do for this case. But this is pretty similar to a charging RC circuit, which is on your test next week. So remember, you have a resistor capacitor connected in a series to a battery. The, the charge in the capacitor builds up over time. Here, the current in the circuit builds up over time and eventually gets to V over R. But the equation for it is very similar to a charging RC circuit. Remember, charging RC circuit was CV times 1 to the minus E times 1 to the minus E to the negative T over tau. So this is V over R times 1 to the minus T over tau. So there's a time constant associated with the circuit, just like for an RC circuit. The time constant is L over R. So if you take the value of L and divide it by R, that gives you the time constant. And then you can use that to do the calculation of the current at any time, if you know what the time constant is. And the time constant is measured in seconds, just like it is for a charging RC circuit. So if you divide uh, Henry's by ohms, which is the unit of L and R, you get seconds, right? Typical units of time. Now, the question is, oh, one more thing. And if you wait one time constant, right, exactly, you know, the time constant, just like for uh, charging RC circuit, you have 63% of the charge, maximum charge in the capacitor, which you should know for next Thursday. Here you have 63% of the maximum current, which is V over R, right? It's 63% of V over R. So it's pretty similar to a, a charging RC circuit for this case here. Then you can have a circuit that's um, the analog of a discharging RC circuit, which is if you remove the battery. So you connect this battery for some time, and there's going to be a current in the circuit. And then you remove the battery. So if you remove the battery without a resistor, right? Sorry. <laughs> without an inductor, right? You just had a resistor here. And you remove the battery, you open the switch. What, what happens to the current? It immediately goes to zero, right? If you remove the battery, it goes from whatever it is immediately to zero, right? What the inductor does is, so the current tries to go to zero, so it decreases, right? The current is decreasing now. So when the current goes through the inductor or the solenoid, the magnetic flux is decreasing, not increasing, right? It's increasing when you have the battery here. Here it's decreasing. If it's decreasing, it creates a current in the same direction as the current that's producing it. So instead of going to zero right away, the solenoid keeps the current going because it produces a changing magnetic flux, a decreasing changing magnetic flux, right? So instead of just going to zero, it keeps the current going for a while. It doesn't go immediately to zero. It takes some time to go to zero. So the equation is this. It's I0 times e to the minus t over tau, which is a, you know, pretty similar to a discharging RC circuit, where it's Q0 times e to the minus t over tau for the charge in the capacitor. So tau is the same thing. And if you wait a really long time, this eventually goes to 0. If you wait exactly one time constant, the current in the circuit is 37% of what it started with, just like for a discharging RC circuit. The charge in the capacitor is 37% of the initial charge if you wait a time constant without a battery. So the, uh, this is what the current looks like versus time for a, with the battery. So it's the same sort, of a, same sort of graph as a charging RC circuit, right? The charge in a capacitor in an RC circuit. This is just one time time Oh, no, this is the whole thing. So this is, if you wait a really long time, it gets up to um, V over R. And then at the time constant, 63% of that, right? And then if you disconnect the battery, it eventually goes to zero, but it takes some time. And when you're at the time constant at 37% of whatever you start with, right? Just like an RC circuit. So this is the only other example I'm going to do today is an example of a LR circuit. This is called an LR circuit, by the way, with a battery and without a battery. And I'll see how it works. But it's, like I said, it's pretty similar to RC circuits. So even though this isn't on your test, on Thursday, obviously, it's pretty similar RC circuit, so you kind of see something similar again. Oops, okay, actually I needed this. All right, so this is the circuit. At first, it's going to have a battery. And
Okay, so this is the circuit. Um, so the voltage of the battery. Uh, I'm gonna move this closer. It's 10 volts. The resistor is two kilo ohms, so that's like, you know, two thousand ohms. That's an ohm. It never looks like an ohm. And the inductance is three millihenries. Uh, that's an M for millihenries. So the first thing you should do for either RC circuits or for these RL circuits is figure out the time constant if you know the if you know what you need to know to figure out the time constant. So for RC circuits, if you know R and C, the first thing you should do is figure out the, uh, the time constant. For this case, if you know R and L, the first thing you should do is figure out the time constant because it's relevant for most other calculations. Okay, so let's figure this out. So for an LR circuit, it'll be on your equation sheet for test four. It's L divided by R. It's going to be it'll be on your equation sheet. You just got to be careful and don't write L times R because it's not L times R. It's L divided by R. Um, but what we're going to do is convert to, unless the units for um, L and R are the same prefix, like suppose they're both uh, milli. So the, the inductance was millihenries and the resistance was milli ohm. Then you can keep them both milli because they cancel out. But if they're not both the same prefix, you have to write them in just in general, right? You have to convert to the base units like henries and ohms, right? So this would be... 2 times 10 to the 3 ohms. Okay, so 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. Technically, it's 3 divided by 2. It's the best way to write it, but if you want to write it as a decimal, it's 1.5. And 10 to the minus 3 divided by 10 to the 3 is 10 to the minus 6th. And the units are seconds, so it's 10 to the minus 1.5 times 10 to the minus 6th seconds. But we can write this a little bit so it looks a little bit better because 10 to the minus 6th is what? micro. So you can say this is 1.50 microseconds, right? That's the time constant for this RL circuit. By the way, you can call it LR or RL. It doesn't really matter uh, which one you put first. Okay, so then um, the next question is if one waited a very long time, uh, this is uh, code for infinite amount of time, but I don't like saying infinite. Um, so this is really the maximum current because if you wait a really long time you know the current gets bigger and bigger and bigger and this is the most it can be so anyway what is the current in the circuit okay so this is basically the current in the circuit if the um, inductor wasn't there right so the inductor if the current if the inductor wasn't there the, the current in the circuit would just be V divided by R through Ohm's law, and that's the most it can get to, right? It can't get any more than that. So it's just um, 10 volts. Once again, you know, if the voltage and the resistance have different prefixes, uh, you have to write them in sort of in general. So this is 5 times 10 to the minus 3 amps. But you can also rewrite this, because what is 10 to the minus 3? Milli, right? So this is 5 milliamps, right? So that's if you wait a really long time. It eventually gets up to 5 milliamps, right? But what if you don't wait a long time, right? So that's the next question. OK, so the next question is, what's the current in the circuit at 1.5 microseconds. Okay, so this is kind of similar to something we asked for RC circuits, right? For charging and discharging. All right, so what is 1.5 microseconds? It's something we already figured out, right? Which is what? Right, it's the time constant, right? So the point is, um, if the time is the time constant, Right, so the time that we happen to wait for happens to be equal to the time constant. Then you can use this equation, the current in the circuit. 
is going to be 63%, like it is for a charging capacitor, 63% of the maximum charge. Here's 63% of the maximum current, right? So we know the maximum current is 5 milliamps. So if you multiply that by 0.63, that tells you how much current is in the circuit at point at uh, 1.5 microseconds or the time constant, is that way you say it. So this is 3.15 milliamps. So that's the current after one and a half microseconds. But this only works if you're at the time constant. So the next question is, what if you're not at the time constant? So we're going to do something related to that. So the question is, what's the voltage across the capacitor, oh, sorry, capacitor, <laughs> resistor is what I meant to say. There is no capacitor. At two microseconds. OK, so first of all, forget, before we get to the current, which we'll get to in a minute, how do you find the voltage across a resistor? as we've been doing for probably a month or five weeks now. It, right, use Ohm's law. So what we need to find is the current in the circuit at two microseconds. And then if we know that, we can multiply it by R, and that gives us our voltage across the, re the resistor. So we need to determine the current at two microseconds. Now, two microseconds is not the time constant. So you can't just use, you know, 0.63. That only works at the time constant, right? In fact, should the current at two microseconds be bigger than 3.15 milliamps or less or equal to 3.15 milliamps? Should it be? Less? So the time is getting bigger, right? And if you wait longer, the current gets bigger over time. No, no, you just think of it from like a time point of view. So the time constant is just one specific time. Okay? And this time is bigger than this that time. So it should be getting bigger. That's how you look at it. Anyway, but the point is you can't just multiply by 0.63. You have to use the entire equation, right? So the entire equation you can write like this. It's really V times R, but V times R is I max. Uh, sorry, V divided by R. I max, which is what we found um, previously, times uh, E to the minus T over tau. That's supposed to be a tau. Um, so anyway, this is 5 milliamps. And the thing at the top is the time. So this time, it's OK to leave the units the way they are, because if the time is in microseconds and the time constant is in microseconds, they cancel out, which is what you want to have happen. Right? So that's fine. So when you put this in your calculator and you do everything correctly, you'll get a current which is larger than 5 milliamps. Uh, sorry, larger than 3.15 milliamps is what I meant to say. You get 3.68. milliamps, right? So that's the current at two microseconds. Thus, we need to do one more step because the question is, what's the voltage across the resistor at that time? So you just take 3.68 uh, milliamps. All right, so once again, the units aren't the same here, right? So the prefixes, I should say. One is milli. The other one's kilo, so you want to switch to the typical units. And uh, actually, 10 to the minus 3 times 10 to the 3 just it makes 1. So it's essentially twice of 3.68. And the units are in volts, so it's 7.36 volts. So that's the voltage across the resistor at two microseconds. OK, so there's one more part we're going to do with a battery, and then go to examples without a battery. The last part with the battery is this. OK, so at two microseconds, 
what's the voltage across the inductor? Now, there is a calculus way. Using calculus, you can find it. Basically, in one of this chair keeps lowering itself. I don't know if you notice that. I keep on getting lower. All the chairs do that, though. So I gotta find better chairs. Anyway. So there's a calculus way of figuring out the voltage across the inductor, but there's another way to do it, which is, of course, the way we're going to do it. So if you go back and look at this um, circuit, right? Suppose these were two resistors uh, connected to one another. Instead of an inductor, you had another resistor. If you took the voltage across each one of these resistors and you added them together, what would it equal? The voltage of the battery. It's the same thing here. The voltage across the resistor plus the voltage across the inductor equals the voltage of the battery. So it's the same thing. In fact, we did it for um, charging RC circuits, a similar thing, where the voltage across the resistor and the capacitor equal the voltage of the battery, right? Right. So what you need to do is find the voltage across the resistor at this time, but we already did that in the last part. And then to find the voltage across the inductor, it's just the voltage of the battery minus the voltage across the resistor at that time. That's it. So this is going to be 10 volts minus 7.36 volts. Of course, you would need to calculate this via uh, VR, right? If you hadn't already done so. But we already did that, so we can just use our answer. Okay, so it's 2.64 volts. So that's the voltage across the um, inductor at this time with the battery. Okay, so does that make sense? Okay, so now we're gonna disconnect the battery for the rest of the problem. So the question is, after a very long, <laughs> getting worse. Okay, so, so you keep the battery connected for a really long time, and then you disconnect the battery after a really long time. And the question is 1.5 microseconds after the Okay, so you have it, like I said, connected for a while, then you disconnect the battery, and the question is, after you disconnect the battery and you wait 1.5 microseconds, the question is, what is the uh, current in the circuit at 1.5 microseconds, right? So what is 1.5 microseconds again? It's the time constant because the L and the R have been changed. It's the same L and R. The only thing you're doing is just taking out the battery, right? So it's the same time constant. So once again, uh, 1.5 microseconds <laughs> is the time constant. So at the time constant, Without a battery, the current is, okay, so you can use, if you wait exactly one time constant, the current in the circuit without a battery is 37% of what you had to begin with. Now, what do we have to begin with? If you waited a really long time, what was the current in the circuit with the battery if you waited a really long time? Yeah, it's the full current, which is five milliamps, right? So, yeah, that's from like part B, right? We do that in part B. So all you do is take 0.37 and you multiply it times five uh, milliamps. And that gives you the current after uh, 1.5 mi microseconds after you disconnect the battery. So then it would go down to 1.85 milliamps from uh, five milliamps when you first disconnect it. Okay, so that's good for the yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is the lens. 
right? That's right, right? Okay. Okay, thanks. I miss those things sometimes. Okay, so the next question, that's, that's how it works with the time constant. So the next part is, what's the current in the circuit? Um, two microseconds, right? Again. Okay, so once again, two microseconds is not the time constant, so you can't just use 0.37. Uh, I can ask the same question I asked before. What do you think the current is at two microseconds compared to 1.5 microseconds? Is it going to be less than 1.85, bigger than 1.85, or equal to 1.5? It's going to be less because the longer you wait, the less current is in the circuit, right? So you should get a smaller number than 1.85. So... The equation you use if you're not at the time constant is this whole thing is I0 times e to the minus t over tau. So it's uh, 5 milliamps, because that's the current you start with, times e to the 2 over 1.5. So once again, as long as they have the same units, either microseconds, milliseconds, seconds, whatever, they cancel out, which is what you want to have happen, and you can leave it in microseconds. Okay, so this becomes 1.32, so that is less than 1.85, which is what you should get. Right, so that's the current after two microseconds. The last part, and then you can take your break, is what's the voltage across the inductor? two microseconds after the battery has been disconnected. All right, let's look at a picture of what the circuit looks like. This, um, I kind of went over something similar to it for discharging RC circuits. In fact, it's just about the same explanation, except you're doing it with uh, an inductor instead of a capacitor, but it's the same basic uh, explanation as uh, discharging RC circuits. All right, this is the circuit without a battery. So once again, I went over this with capacitors and resistors, but let's do it again here for inductors and resistors. So if you measure the voltage here, right after the resistor, right, and you measure the voltage here, what's true about those two points? They're equal, right? Because there's nothing between them. If I measure the voltage here on the other side of the resistor and the voltage here on the other side of the inductor, what's true about those two points? It's the same. So what's true about the voltage across the resistor, which is essentially the difference of those voltages, and the voltage across the inductor, which is the difference of the voltages for the inductor? They're equal. Well, yeah, they're equal and opposite, but equal, equal is the main thing, right? They have the same change, right? So just like a RC circuit without a battery, the voltage of the resistor is equal to the voltage of the capacitor without a battery. Here, the voltage of the inductor, they say right? the voltage of the resistor is equal to the voltage of the capacitor without a battery in an RC circuit. Here, the voltage of the inductor is equal to the voltage of the resistor without a battery in an LR circuit. So all you do is just take the current at that time and multiply it by the resistance, and that gives you the voltage across the resistor and the inductor, right? So this becomes, I'm going to borrow something because it's easier, it's this, but I'm going to change the current to 1.32. You got to, once again, convert to ohms and uh, amps, right, when you do this. But this is 1.32, right? That's the difference between these two things. And you get the voltage of the inductor to be 2.64. And the voltage across the resistor is also 2.64. So that's how you do these RL circuits, right? They're pretty similar to RC circuits. Okay, so what I normally do here is start talking about AC circuits. The next thing we're gonna talk about, uh, the major topic is AC circuits, but you know, there's a test next week, so I'm not gonna do that, I'm gonna do something else. But what I'm going to do after the test, not before the test, after it, is put a little flipped video on the theory and concept of AC circuits, and then after the test, we'll do examples with AC circuits, right? But that's after the test, right? Just focus on the test uh, before then. 
But take your break when you come back. I'm going to do something uh, else, a little bit fun. Record part of it. And then part of it really won't make sense. <laughs> I'm watching online. But anyhow, whatever. Oops. I just. Hold on. Did you say pencil sharpener? Yeah, pencil sharpener. Okay, so what I have here is a generator. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward what this thing does. There's a crank here. When I turn the crank, it spins some gears, and then inside, you can't see it, but there's a coil in here in a magnetic field, right? So when I wrote, when I crank this thing, it spins the coil, and the coil sends a current through this light bulb, and if there's a current through the light bulb, then the light bulb glows. So it's as simple as it gets, but this is how you produce electrical power. So, you know, I'm putting my energy into the electrical energy of the light bulb. So when you do that, you can see that it works. But if I crank it faster, it gets brighter. So why does it get brighter when I crank it faster? Anyone know? There's multiple ways of looking at it. One of the ways would work. No, not really a torque. Because when you increase omega, which is what I'm doing, it's putting it faster. That changes the flux faster, and it gives you more current. The other way to think about it is I'm putting more energy into it, which gets transferred into the light bulb. So that's how it gets spread. Now, something else to pay attention to, though you can't see it, but no one can see this, but trust me, it's happening. I'll try to show you, but no one's going to be able to see it. If I spin it really slowly, it barely glows, but not only does it barely glow, it flickers. So does anyone know why it's flickering when you spin it slowly? Something like that, though it's more straightforward than that, but what you're saying is essentially that like, basically it's an AC current, right? Mm -hmm. So what is true for AC currents, what happens to them at one point? Yeah. It goes to zero. It goes to zero, it goes to zero, it goes to zero. So at a certain point, the current becomes zero because it's switching direction from one way to the other way. And when it goes to zero, it shuts off and it flickers. So the question would be, well, when you crank it quickly, why is it not flicker? Or the better question is, why is it appear to not flicker? It's going too fast. Your eyes can't. The eyes can't detect that. It is. The lights in this classroom are flickering, but you really can't tell they're flickering. But they are flickering, right? It's not a constant uh, voltage or constant current, is a better way to say it, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I mean, when you see light bulbs flickering in your house, it probably means your power's about to go out, <laughs> which is slightly different than, than that. But yes, if, if it's flickering, it's going too slow in general, right? Just in general. Okay. All right, so the next thing I want to go over, I have some other things to show you, but I have to go back to the PowerPoint first before I can show you this other stuff. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is how do materials become magnetized? So for instance, we talked about how magnetic fields are produced. They're produced by currents. So you look at your magnetic, your magnet on the refrigerator. There's no current in the magnet. Well, there is kind of, which I'll explain. But you don't think of it as a current running around that magnet that you have on your refrigerator. It's just stuck there. You know, there's no current. There's no circuit in it. So the way it works is the material that makes up your um, magnet, something like iron, which is ferromagnetic. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, but when you look at iron, by the way, to really understand this stuff, you need to know quantum mechanics. But this works pretty well, too. I mean, the, the general idea is true. To get it, when you get into the details, you have to know quantum mechanics. Anyway, the point is this. When you, um, when you look at a uh, hunk of iron by itself, right, you have all these atoms in it, right? And then you have these um, electrons more or less going in a circle. I mean, it doesn't really go in a circle, but more or less, they go in a circle. So they're like tiny little circular loops, right, that are like on the test next week, right? If you have a circular loop of current, it produces two things. It produces one a magnetic field, two, a magnetic moment, which you have to know for the test next week, right? How to calculate both of them. 
for a circular wire or some other shape for a magnetic moment. But definitely for a circular wire, you need a magnetic field. Now, they're given by the same right-hand roll, so they point in the same direction. The magnetic moment is in the same direction as the magnetic field at the center of a circular wire. So before, any, before you do anything to, say, a piece of metal, all these electrons are in basically sort of random orbits. That's right. So basically, they produce magnetic moments in random directions and also magnetic fields in random directions. So the magnetic fields act like vectors. If they're all in random directions, they basically cancel each other out. There's no net magnetic field. You don't see any, you know, it doesn't behave like a magnet. However, if you put it into a magnetic field somehow, generate a magnetic field, maybe from a solenoid or something, and stick a piece of iron into a solenoid, for a ferromagnetic material, basically, it's easy to rotate. Remember, for any material, basically, the, uh, the uh, magnetic moments want to align with the field. Remember, we went over that? So for, magnetic mo for ferromagnetic materials, it's particularly easy to do this. They do this easily. They rotate, so they align very easily, right? So basically, if they all align with the field, then all their magnetic fields point in the same direction. When you put them in a field, and now it becomes magnetic, because they're all in the same direction, not in random directions. And the question is, how do you keep them in that direction, right? So this is when you stick it in a magnetic field. Suppose you remove the magnetic field. How do you keep it as a magnet when your magnetic field is away? Because this is only when it's here. Well, if you cool it down, then temperature basically controls how much the molecules basically shake. So when it's cooler, they shake less and they're sort of locked in place. And it becomes a magnet like this. So room temperature, uh, the magnet on your refrigerator is locked in, right? If you make it hotter, what happens is it jiggles all the atoms and they all get rearranged again. And it loses the magnetic property. So you could try this if you wanted to. If you take a magnet and you stick it into an oven, and you, you know, put it on like 500 degrees for a few minutes and take it out, it's not going to be the same magnet. It might be, it might still be magnetic, but it's not going to be as much as it was before, and it might completely lose its magnetism completely and not be a magnet at all anymore. So that's what happens when you, uh, and to get the magnet back, what you need to do is heat it up again so the, they're easier, to, so the atoms are easier to move. Stick it in a magnetic field and then cool it back down to room temperature, and then it would be a uh, magnet again. Right? That's how magnets become magnetized. So, this is related to something interesting related to the uh, Mid Atlantic Ridge in the middle of the Atlantic. You can kind of see in that picture there's a ridge um, that's pretty much dead center Atlantic, in the Atlantic Ocean. So, basically, uh, material from the uh, Earth's core and mantle comes up through the crust in that point, and the uh, ocean gets wider, right? The Atlantic Ocean is getting wider. It's spreading apart at that point. So what you have here is basically lava coming up at the bottom of the ocean. The lava is pretty hot. And, with the lava, and there's uh, some ferromagnetic materials in the lava, and basically, they see the Earth's magnetic field and they align with the Earth's magnetic field. And then they move a little ways away and they cool down because it's like, you know, I don't know how many miles under the ocean that is. It's pretty cold down there. So they instantly cool off and they lock in the magnetic field of the Earth. Whatever the Earth's magnetic field is, if you look at the material there, it's in the same direction as the Earth's magnetic field. However, if you go a little ways away from here, remember it's spreading out from the middle, and you look at the magnetic field of the rocks there, it's in the opposite direction of what it is now. If you go a little ways away again, it's in the same direction. If you go a little ways again, it's in the opposite direction. So what that means is, as you go further away from the center, you're going further back in time because the thing spreads out over time. What that means is, it, many times over the Earth's history, the magnetic field has been in the opposite direction than it is now. So what that means is the Earth's magnetic field somehow, we haven't figured out how, uh, flips from time to time. The North Pole becomes the South. It's like a magnet just flipping over. What is that? Is it? I think it was a little bit, something, something like that. 
I mean, order of thousands of years. I thought it was a little bit longer than that. But yeah, so geologically speaking, it happens kind of often, you know, in the course of human life. No, it's not that often. But actually, we're due for one. It's been a while since it flipped. Um, yeah, they, they always drift. So they're drifting, whether it flips uh, any time within their you know, lifetimes of something. We don't really know. But yeah, pretty soon it's going to flip, whether it could be, it could be 50 years from now, it could be a thousand years from now, it could be 500 years from now, but it will flip again. Now when it flips, when they measure the magnetic field right when it flips, which is right over there, it turns out it's pretty small. It could actually be zero, like zero, like there's no magnetic field. Uh, they're not quite sure how small it gets, if it actually goes to zero, they think it goes to zero. They're not quite sure how long it lasts, how long it takes to flip. Um, but there could be some a period of time where the Earth's magnetic field becomes zero when it's flipping. And that's a problem because the Earth's magnetic field uh, shields us from cosmic radiation, which is generally bad if it just streams into the Earth. So that's something you have to maybe pay attention to. Although there's a lot of things you have to pay attention to. I don't want to, we don't really worry about any of them. Um, but that's something that could happen, right? So they might free that out by looking at the magnetic field locked in rocks, right, near the Earth's, uh, near the middle Atlantic Ridge, right? All right, so this is something just kind of interesting. Um, so this is other, so, prop, you know, materials can be ferromagnetic, meaning they're, you know, the magnetic moment's more or less easy to uh, switch. Uh, there's this other pro property called diamagnetism, which is basically completely explained with quantum mechanics. It's a little bit hard to understand, but you can understand it in some sense. It's basically due to a changing magnetic flux through these electron magnetic moments, right? So you have this magnetic moment from the electron, right? So you have this, essentially, it's, it's a current of wire, right? These little electrons orbiting the, the atom. And if you change the magnetic field, through these currents, if you increase the magnetic field, that induces a current that goes in the opposite direction. It's kind of like the solenoid we just did. And you have two magnetic fields going opposite directions, and it produces this sort of levitation sort of effect. Now, diamagnetism is a very small, um, typically very small uh, property of a, of a body. If you put something in a typical magnetic field, the amount of diamagnetism is usually pretty small. However, if you put something in a big magnetic field, the effect becomes larger and can be observed. So that's what they do at UF, not, not UF, FSU. FSU is a high magnetic field laboratory. No, not this one. I don't know. Oh, I know what happened. I opened up two videos. OK. So at the, um, so at FSU, they, they generate these gigantic magnetic fields, something like. 10 Tesla, 20 Tesla, and they're gigantic. Um, and uh, yeah, so what they did is they took a frog, stuck it in this gigantic magnetic field, and because the magnetic field was so huge and the frog was small, it was like a tiny frog like this, the effect of the diamagnetism became pretty obvious, and basically the thing just floats. But the frog isn't really affected at all. In fact, I don't think he knows what's going on. But. Uh, yeah, that's a frog floating in a magnetic field, right? Created by a magnetic field, right? So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. All right, so that's just something. What was that? The frog? No, I just want to let it go. You can tell his friends. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. <laughs> That is a good question. They probably just let it go, though. Yeah, that's a snapshot of it. Okay, so that's something just interesting that you know can be created by magnetic fields. Uh, this is another interesting application of magnetic uh, induction. It's how a microphone works. So this is basically any microphone. So I use this. Thing, right? If you look at the microphone, you see this. All you see is this part of the microphone. This is like the diaphragm of the microphone. What's that part is. But if you look behind the, that part, it looks like this. So this is the diaphragm. This is the part I just showed you. 
uh, or basically this part here. And then behind it is a magnet. And attached to the diaphragm is a coil, which basically floats around the magnet, more or less. And when you, um, when a sound wave approaches the microphone, which a sound wave is basically uh, fluctuation and sound pressure, right? So this part is like high pressure, this part is low pressure. That's basically what a sound wave is. So when it comes into the, when this part comes in to the diaphragm, it pushes the magnet, uh, sorry, pushes not the magnet, pushes the diaphragm towards the magnet, which increases the magnetic flux passing through the coil because it's getting closer to the magnet, right? So the magnetic flux increases which reduces a current in the coil that goes in one direction when this part is coming in. Then when this part comes in, it's low pressure, so it actually sucks the, it's like a vacuum, more or less. So it sucks the diaphragm the other way, and when it moves the diaphragm this way, uh, the magnetic flux decreases because it's getting further away from the magnet, and the current goes around the other way. So it produces this AC current that corresponds exactly to the sound wave, right? You have a current going one way when it's being pushed in, when it's being pulled out, it's going the other way. But that is exactly what this thing is. In other words, the electrical signal is exactly what the sound wave is. The same frequency as the sound wave, uh, proportional to the amplitude of the sound wave. So this is why, this is typically called an analog signal, because it's an analog to the sound wave that's coming in, right? Okay. So that's how a microphone works. It transmits it into electrical signal, but then the other problem is how do you get that electrical signal to be a sound again, right? Because that's only part of it, right? This is the only thing you had. All you see was a current in the circuit, which doesn't do you any good. What you want to do is hear it eventually. So speakers, which is what I have here, are basically the same thing, basically, as a microphone. So this is a speaker. And there's a magnet. So this is the part that you see all the time, right? But behind it, there's a magnet, and there's something else, which I'll show you here. So this is the magnet here, which produces a magnetic field. And then you have a coil of wire here. It's the same, basically like the same coil of wire. And you have a diaphragm here, which is the part you see, right? And what you do is you take the current that's created by the microphone, or whatever, but let's just say it's from the microphone and you pass it through the coil that goes around the magnet, or in between the magnet, right? There's a, there's a wire, there's a coil that goes around that's between these two magnets. So what's going on here? Well, the current comes, uh, you know, the current's AC, so it's going one way, it's going the other way, it's going one way, it's going the other way. So at one point, it's like so, sort of going into the plane in this picture here, right? If you look at this side here. And there's a magnetic field going in some direction, say it's the, in the x direction or whatever, this way. So when you do the uh, right-hand rule for this case, you know, the magnetic force on this current here, right? The current, your fingers are the direction of the current, your uh, palm faces in the direction of the magnetic field, which is maybe to the right or something. And when you do that, um, so this would be sort of the negative Z direction, by the way, in this picture, right? So this is a, into the plane. So it would be negative Z, and then your uh, palm faces to the right, say, anyhow. The point is, your thumb would be pointing towards you or away from you. That's the main idea, right? So what I'm saying is that the magnetic force is either this way or that way, depending on how the current's going. So when the current's going one way, the magnetic force pushes the speaker out this way. When it's going the other way, it pushes it back this way and it reproduces the exact same sound wave that came in, right? It just vibrates the same way as the sound wave that came in, and that produces the sound that you hear. That's how a speaker works, basically. Now, I always tell this story every year because it's kind of an interesting story and kind of funny. Um, so I do the quiz and the homework solutions at home because it's kind of weird to do them in my office for, well, first of all, there's people. Second of all, it looks like I'm talking to myself. <laughs> in my office, so I just do them at home because it's easier. And uh, this is a, quite a few years ago, I don't remember, like six, seven years ago. It's not really important when it was. But I forgot my microphone uh, to do the recording. So I was thinking I could go to school to get the microphone and go back and do the video. It was kind of late at night. I didn't feel like doing that if I couldn't. So I was like, well, what do I have? I didn't have any microphones. But then I realized, well, a speaker is basically a microphone. So, 
Yeah, so what I did is I took headphones, which are speakers, that way, yeah, which are essentially speakers on your ear, and I uh, plugged them into my microphone jack in my computer, and you just talk into your speaker, into the headphone, and it works as a speaker. It works actually pretty well. It wasn't perfect. It's not as clear as a microphone, but it actually was fairly clear, and it worked in a pinch. So that's something you can try. If you take your headphones, stick them into your microphone jack, and speak in the, <laughs> speak in the, the headphone, it becomes a microphone. Of course, you look really strange doing that if you don't start to do that, but it's true. OK, so the other thing, so this is kind of interesting, too. It's just a point. It's not really related to magnetic induction, but while I was talking about speakers, I thought I'd mention something about speakers here. Uh, so this is kind of a fun thing. If you're making a uh, tweeter, which essentially is what this is, so tweeters, if you look at a whole uh, speaker, I don't know what, I mean, this is part of the speaker, right? So like a whole speaker usually has a big thing called a woofer and this thing called a tweeter, which is a smaller thing. And the reason why this thing is small is because it's producing high frequency, right? It's producing the highest frequency that you hear. Now, to produce high frequency, basically that means it has to go back and forth quickly. So to go back and forth quickly, this thing has to be pretty light and therefore pretty small. If you try to make a woofer, which is this gigantic speaker, go back and forth quickly, it's actually pretty hard because of the mass of the speaker, right? The bigger it is, the harder it is to get it to go back and forth. So big uh, woofers make horrible tweeters, but little tweeters make good tweeters. That's why they're, they're small. So of course, the lightest thing you can possibly use to make a speaker or a tweeter is air itself, right? So they've come up with these things called plasma arc speakers, which are pretty cool. Um, and I'll show you what these things look like. Um, so, okay, <laughs> that was a long time ago. So they had these things up for a while. But, so that thing, is producing all the sound, right? So basically, it's a plasma, which is an ionized gas. It's basically just a fancy term for air, right? So it's vibrating. They have it set up. It's not, you know, you can't just randomly do this. They have a circuit hooked up to it that's controlling it. But it's vibrating. You can't really see it vibrating. But it's producing then all the sound, right? It's just coming from that vibrating light, that thing, right? which is kind of cool. I think they have them in some commercial speakers now because they came up with these things like 10 to 15 years ago, which is kind of, I, I need to look into that more. But anyhow, I just wanted to show you. Um, all right, so the, there's one last thing to show you that's related to magnetic induction. And that is this, right? This is a whiteboard. Right? So let's see. Electric guitar. I don't want to take it out of the bag because I thought it was going to fall over. Actually, um, I'm going to stop the video because this is, I mean, no one sees this, right? I mean, for this, we least saw the PowerPoint. But this, I'm just holding up the guitar and pointing to her guitar. And everyone's going to be like, what? Are, 